welcome to the fourth episode of What's Up Genealogy. And tonight we have Tessa and Linda, and then we are interviewing Dan Heaston. But let, let me go ahead and let Tessa uh, introduce herself and tell you a little bit about some of her groups on Google+. Plus. Okay, I'm Tessa Keogh, and the two groups that I'm involved with on Google Plus are the Legacy Virtual Users Group, which now has a community, so come check us out and attend our meetings every third Thursday, as well as the Guild of One Name Studies. And for any of you who follow that, they're having their AM or AGM conference this weekend, and that's also going to be covered on Google Plus, so watch out for that one. Oh, that is cool. And also, any of the links uh, to the panelists, for our interviewer, interviewee, as well as anything we talk about, news and tips, will be on my blog posted 15, 20 minutes after we stop broadcasting. So, um, Linda, go ahead and introduce yourself. I'm Linda McCauley, and uh, I'm also involved with Tessa with the Legacy Virtual Users Group. She started that about a, a year ago, I guess now, and uh, it's... Uh, growing all the time, especially with the new community. Uh, another Google Plus community that I'm involved with is a recently formed Kentucky genealogy uh, group that was started by Sherry Daniels, who is the senior librarian at the Kentucky Historical Society. So if you have Kentucky ancestors, check us out. And I have, let's say I've got two communities on Google+. Plus. One of them is Tech for Genealogy uh, and Family History Researchers, as well as, and that one's a public one, so anybody can join, and um, you don't even have to ask to join. You just go and ask a question. Join and ask, ask a question or share some information. Uh, the other one I have is um, one, it's, for non-professionals, meaning uh, even if you are a professional genealogist, you take that cap off when you come in and we just talk about your research. Uh, if you have some research successes, you have brick walls, we have a great new um, hangout thing that's going to be going on, not a hangout on air, but a hangout for breaking down those walls. So we'll go, we'll have like an hour where we go over whatever uh, research problems that you're having and hopefully the group will have some suggestions for you. So keep, stay tuned for when that's going to be. We're going to do that twice a month. Um, getting to the news, we've got lots of news this evening. Uh, the genealogy related, related Kickstarter projects. We've Kathleen Brandt got hers, is, is completely funded, as well as um, Maureen Taylor's. And she's got, and, and don't stop giving if you have a little more, if you haven't given yet, because um, they can use extra money uh, for other parts of the projects. Uh, and then the other one is StoryPress. It just started April 1st, launched. It's an app where uh, you can actually use the app now for just doing a, a oral interviews, but uh, the the project is to expand it and be able to do video as well with your, um, and all, across all platforms. We interviewed him last week, uh, Mike Davis with StoryPress. So um, the link will be on my website to go straight to the Kickstarter project. It's also in the Tech for Genealogy community as well. It's been posted in there. Um, the 48-hour ephemera challenge is back. I um, impulsively purchased, well, I had my eye on this sucker, this Vic hundred, over 100-year-old um, Victorian photo album. I've been keeping my eye on it, and I went in to do something else at an antique mall, and the actual vendor, who I'd never met her before, was in, and she was like, oh, I've got this. She, she was like looking at, I was looking at ephemera, and she was like, oh, I've got this in my, my booth, and you know, I've got a Victorian album, and I have it off for 50% off, cash or check, and I said, oh, I, just, I got credit. What can you do for me if I have, oh, well, 45% off. So I bought it for $53 because I'm a sucker, but it's got like four tintype photos in there as well as, let's see, about 35 other type, you know, card type photos. So um, we're busy trying to put it all together. Some of them are identified, and it also came with this like typewritten um, thing, this little note uh, by somebody who, who I guess sold it, or that's what the vendor told me, that it was sold from the family in Ohio. So we're busy over there researching that and trying to bring out the story, coax out the story from all the ephemera that's in there with the information and clues that have been given to us. Everybody from different levels 
are doing it. Some people just watch, and that's fine because you'll 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 learn something. You'll see how different researchers attack a, a problem on with online resources. You'll find people use resources that you've never even heard of, and you and so it's really worth just even watching if you um, aren't able to help us. The next thing on my list for news, we got Dear Myrtle's one month anniversary bash hangout on air Monday night. Um, and again, the link is going to be on my site. Uh, and she's got prizes. So I'm definitely going to be there. Party and prizes. Two, two, two great things. Um, the other thing is Jill Ball's uh, Roots Tech interviews. Uh, they're video interviews. I love them. You have to go see them uh, on her YouTube channel. They're, they're great. Uh, she, I know that she did a few last year, and she just like took the ball and ran with those interviews this year. So they're really, they're really good. Um, next on the list is J. Mark Lowe's webinar, Developing Research Plans While Staying on Track in a Modern World. It's April 9th, so that's Tuesday. Uh, it's open to members and non-members of the APG. So uh, you really, if you really want to learn how to do a very technical research plan and uh, one that's up to professional standards, this is, this is the webinar for you. So definitely check, check that out, and it's free. Um, the other thing is that the Digital Public Library of America is launching April 18th and 19th. Ladies, did y'all hear about that? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That is so cool. It's a project to make the holdings of America's research libraries and archives uh, and museums available to everyone for free online. And that is a huge undertaking. Uh, so I, I can't wait to see how, the, how that evolves and what that looks like. And they've um, done a lot of the work already on getting permissions, which was something that Google had a problem with because Google was going to try and be the owner of the data afterwards. And what they're doing is, is taking a different approach that it continues to be each library or archives data, but they're just going to be a holding facility digitally for it. So um, mm -hmm. they've done a lot of the, the groundwork or spade work so that they can get this up and running pretty quickly. It's very impressive. It is impressive, and I, I can't wait to see how it evolves and what comes out of it. That's going to be such a huge resource, uh, online resource for researchers everywhere. Um, when it comes to online information, more is always better. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. But just a reminder, not everything is online yet. Of so course not. <laughs> you know, if you're hitting a brick wall because you can't find it online, then it's time to go offline. So, um, Missouri State Archives is putting marriage records online from the territorial period through 1969. That's over 3 million records. Again, this is going to be free. I think they're doing it in a partnership with Family Search. Um, wow, because I know that they, there are marriage records for Missouri on Ancestry because that's where I found my grandfathers. But here, they're going to, this is a huge time period. Do y'all have Missouri? Uh, connections where you're going to need to use this resource or I mean Yes, indeed. And in fact, what's on Ancestry, once you read more about it, when it always says learn more, uh, it didn't have the counties that my um, ancestors were mm. from as part of the group. So I'm hoping, since the archives is planning on putting all the records on, that this will include all of the counties. So I'm looking forward to that. That's a great thing. I wish I had some use for it, but <laughs> I'm a true southerner. I have very little reason to cross the Ohio or the Mississippi River <laughs> with my research. Well, I have both my line, my lines and my husband's lines. We have Missouri in there both, and so this is important because Missouri was what the gateway to the west, mm -hmm. and you have um, so many people that were going through there on their way out west. Mine didn't go out west, but you know, still they, they ended up in Missouri. So um, this is going to be very, very, ex very helpful for, for a lot of researchers. Um, they're very excited about that. Um, next thing is uh, Denise Levinick. She has a free webinar tomorrow. It's a part of the um, Southern California Genealogical Society's Jamboree Extension series, break down walls with home sources, and I guarantee you those home sources are going to ha involve a lot of ephemera. So, you know, <laughs> so definitely, you know, watch that. 
to, tomorrow, uh, participate in the, the 48 hour ephemera challenge because you're really going to pick up tools and tips on, on how to coax the information and use those clues to find more about your ancestors. You know, um, there's a lot of clues and even just a postcard. Just a postcard, you can find so much. The last thing I have is uh, on my list is the Legacy mobile app was is just now been made available for download. It's not for Legacy software. It is a and so that's a really bad name. They should have renamed it. Um, what it does is it syncs in, it, it's your family tree and it syncs info from Billion Graves and um, Family Search and you're able to search records through it on Family Search. So I'll be interested to see how that works. It only has, uh, I believe, iOS devices right now for it. Have y'all heard about it or? I've heard of it, but I haven't looked into it. Yeah. yeah I heard about it. And I guess during Reach Tech, it was announced. I think maybe. But uh, yeah. I haven't looked at it because I don't have a tree loaded to Family Search. So. Yeah, I don't either. Well, I think I start. Well, I did one for my article that I wrote because I had to play with it. Um, but that's not my main one, and I didn't I didn't load up a GEDCOM. I started one on there just to play with it. Um, so I don't know if I, I'd use that because that's not where my tree is. And I'm leaning towards, I, mean, I have it on Ancestry, and behind my blog, that is the biggest amount, or I get the biggest responses from uh, potential cousins through it. So, um, but I, what I want to do now is probably make a website with my family tree with what I've proven, completely proven, and put that out there as well, um, just to have it Google searched, sort indexed. So, uh, I'll be looking into that. But I, I just don't see me putting it in another system, yet another one, because I have a GEDCOM uploaded to Macavo. I have one on um, my heritage, um, and then I've ha I have all the different ones I covered in that article of the One World Tree. <laughs> so I have a version of my tree and all of those that I started, including Wiki Tree. So I just don't see me putting it in yet another something I don't own. Mm -hmm. So, um, but anyway, did y'all have any other news or anything y'all wanted to, to volunteer? I think you covered it. I think I covered <laughs> quite, covered quite a bit. Um, here's my tip. For, for this week, and it does talk about blogging. Get your genealogical and family history research online somehow. Um, my biggest place that I collaborate with other researchers or that I, I get connected with them is through my blog because it is searched, you know, it's indexed by Google, and that people find me because what's, you gotta think, you gotta take yourself out of the position of what you're in as a family history researcher and think about it how John Q public is is using Google to access you know and to search for their family history sometimes it's because their kid has a project and they need to help them with it and they aren't going to buy an ancestry.com subscription for that so they're gonna go straight to Google because that's that's the number one search engine. That's what everybody knows and everybody talks about. So you kind of have to think from their perspective how they're going to find the information. And a lot of times it isn't through Ancestry. Um, so you've got to get, and the easiest way to get it out there is in a blog. Um, and then if you want to get more serious about it, then start a tree and have a tree online. Um, if you have an Ancestry subscription, I would suggest that because that's my second biggest one that I get traffic from and get connections and make connections. I just made connections, um, you know, several months ago and actually got to meet my second cousin and now I have a lead on how to find the other second cousin because she lives on some gravel road, you know, in, in somewhere in the country in Texas, central Texas. So, um, I would never have been able to find her. You know, she's been doing genealogy for 50 years, and um, she's not able to access the internet anymore because she's losing her sight. So she is, and and she's got a whole other whole other mess of stuff to worry about. So my point is, is I never would have been able to connect with her 
unless this other cousin had found me and had come to Texas and and was looking at tombstones. And that's the other thing I wanted to mention as part of my tip is remember that everyone has different reasons for researching. It might be because their kid has a project and that's the extent of, of you know their interest. It might be because they love tombstones and they want to take pictures of tombstones and they're, and they're just not into you know documents and things. They're just not in as deep as you are. Um, and that is perfectly fine because it, they can bring a part of the story um, of your families that that is necessary for you to be able to do more of your research and that's important. Um, Tessa, what, what is your tip for the week? Okay, my tip is to always remember when you're doing your research and especially online research to do two steps forward and two steps back and by that I mean today I was researching they're not my family, they're my um, sister's husband's family and I was looking online and it's an area that I don't usually work with it's Kansas State Census and what you need to do is you need to go two, two pages forward and two pages back because that census is three pages long and so there's a lot of information don't assume that that first image you see has it all same issue with naturalization paperwork that's images same issue with um, some citizenship information. So take a look at that even with the census I'm finding that these families in Kansas and Texas and Oklahoma all kind of band together and the brothers and sisters and the parents are a page backwards or a page forward and so that's how I'm finding them and that's normally something I hadn't really thought about but I started doing this to see you know what was in the document and I'm definitely going to go back and recheck some of my other work. <laughs> Yeah, great tip. You know, with U.S. passport applications on Ancestry, don't forget that second page because that second page down in the bottom right-hand corner, corner on later ones will have a picture of the person who is applying for that passport application. And that's how I first saw a picture of my grandfather on my mom's side. I had never seen a picture of him before. He he passed away before way before I was born. And um, so I had never seen, and he was a jerk, <laughs> so there were no pictures of him. And I, well, none that I had seen and none that I, my family had, and that was the only way I had ever seen him before, laid eyes on him. So very, it's very moving to see that picture. The other thing is World War One draft registration cards, you know, or the number, World War Two draft registration cards, you know, you want to get that second page, you know, second the opposite side so you just make sure that you're looking that's a great tip Tessa and Linda um, I would expand a little bit on your sharing your information online I've done that I had a, a website three years before I had a blog and I've had the blog now for three years and I can't begin to tell you how many people have contacted me I wish I'd kept track of it I do now but but extend that to offline as well most historical and genealogical societies in local areas have a set of surname or family files or whatever they happen to call them and they're more than happy to have a copy of your research that pertains to that area so especially if you visit there be sure and share something with them I usually wait until I get home in case I find something that I want to include in in what I give them and then send it back to them but I've actually had contacts, not nearly as many as I get from online, but a few, as long as you have your contact information on that uh, report or whatever that you give them, people will find you that way too. As well as local libraries, your local library. Libraries as well, yes. Uh -huh. Especially if you're, maybe, because I don't, I don't live in a county where I have any research at all in my family, but I do in San Antonio, so putting one over there would make sense because that's where a lot of my family is from so great great tip that also takes care of preserving some of your research for years and years and years because as long as that society exists they'll maintain those files absolutely definitely great tips so now now I would like to introduce who we're interviewing and it's Dan Heaston I said your name right right Perfect. It's, okay. it's a hard. It's a hard name. You know, I would. I would totally say hi, Stan. So yes. I. I want to well. say hi, Stan, but it's Heston. Yeah. Yes. It, no. Okay. That's the perfect pronunciation. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> well, tell us a little bit about you. 
Okay. Well, the first thing I'm, I, I'm the first thing is I, I'm the reason we're four minutes late tonight. Um, that's the first thing I want to admit. Uh, I broke the computer pretty much. But anyway, we're we're good to go. Um, no, I'm, I'm Dan, and I'm with the company um, called Housetory, uh, and we do a couple of products. One's called the Heirloom Registry, and the other one's called the Home History Book. And <clears throat> excuse me, my brother and I started the company. Boy, I guess it's been 2007 is when we first started it, and our first product is, is called the Home History Book, and we started that. It took us like four years just to, to create the Home History Book, and the Home History Book, I'll just really briefly explain what it is, because I think we're gonna, probably going to mostly concentrate on the, on the heirloom registry tonight. Um, the Home History Book, is, it's, it's, it's kind of like an archival quality journal, uh, like almost like a baby book for a home, so it's a little different than um, you know, regular genealogy in the sense that you're, you're actually studying the genealogy of the house that you're in. Um, so you can record the beginning history of the home, you know, who's, uh, the renovations, who's living there now, um, any stories you want to record. And the idea is you'd actually leave it, the homeowner would leave it with the house so that the next owner would kind of know what had happened, you know. So it's kind of a you know, little bit different take on genealogy. Um, and then the other product that kind of evolved very similar to that, that actually evolved um, a few years after we started the, the home history book and, and actually got that going. Is called the heirloom registry, and the, and the heirloom registry is, is uh, and sorry if you can hear my nephews are outside uh, the door there. Um, okay. The heirloom registry is um, it's it's a way for you to make sure the stories behind your family heirlooms and the heirlooms stay connected, because really that's you know that's that's what makes an heirloom an heirloom. It's it's the stories behind them, you know, like the the quilt that's been handed down from grandma, or you know, the grandfather clock that's been been handed down for your great grandfather. You know, they all have okay. stories. Okay. Exactly, okay. exactly, <laughs> just, exactly. Or, and I think you actually, uh, we did a scavenger hunt, um, I think you did, and you actually registered a, a painting that, that meant something to you. Yeah. So, yep, the um, one right behind me. Exactly, exactly, that painting right there. So, But we make sure that the story and the heirloom stay connected, and so um, that's pretty much it. I mean, it's, it's pretty simple. We use um, uh, stickers and brass plates, and they have, like, unique ID numbers. It's kind of mm -hmm. like a, a license plate for your heirloom, in a sense, and so you uh. affix that to the heirloom. And then the idea would be that say someone sees that that unique number, um, mm -hmm. say in 20 or 30 years, your kids are cleaning out the garage, they see this number, um, they could look up the heirloom story online where they can see f photos of the heirloom, um, the story behind the heirloom, all that kind of stuff. So yeah, no, I think it's a I, well, I think both of them are great. I mean, I would never have thought. I mean, because you can now. I mean, if you have the book mm -hmm. now, is Obviously, like if you live in an area where there aren't any historical homes, it's still a great idea for new homes, though, too, because yeah, you're using you know, it for later generations. Exactly. I mean, it really works for any house in the sense that, um, you know, because we, we really believe every house has a story and all the things in the house, you know, that really mean something, they, they have stories, too. And so, mm -hmm. um, definitely, I mean, in fact, in some ways, it's easier if it is a new house because you have the story from the very beginning. So, yeah. Yeah. That is neat, especially if you like built the house, so you can even get you know journal some of that information in there as well. Exactly, yeah. exactly. That so. is so cool. Yeah. And and the heirloom registry, I, I really love that idea because um, you know I've and I've got so much to do <laughs> with you, um, and and it's not it's not just like something that's you know real expensive or anything it can be a letter it can be something small but it's meaningful to you or your family and your family's history so exactly I really, I really like um, I like that idea because I know that it's real popular with the QR codes you know people had ideas about doing that for um, tombstones and things like that and it's mm -hmm. almost the same idea you know. it's, it's really some, you know, it's, it's essentially like an asset tag. I mean, like, you know, companies use asset tags for their office equipment, um, which frankly... And it looks I mean, just like that, though, the asset yeah, tags. Like yeah, it's, it's very, it's, exactly. It's just the tag. Mm -hmm. It has a, you know, number or a, 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 like a little a code there. And so, you, you know, it's a way for them to keep track of their stuff. But the thing is, no one's really doing this for... I think the things that really matter, which are things that, that mean something to you and your family. And, you know, Absolutely. heirlooms, I mean... Let's face it. I mean, if 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 you know when when your loved ones pass on, and um, you know whether it's your parents or your grandparents, that's sometimes your only connection to them. Mm -hmm. That physical, like literally something they physically held, or you know maybe they went out and took the time to buy. I mean, these are these are you know vital parts of family history. So, well, and, in fact and you, that, yeah. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just going to say the the way the 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 my brother. I wish I could take 
you know, credit for these ideas. I, I can't. Um, <laughs> don't tell him that, though. Um, he's my older brother, Mike, and we have we actually have four four brothers and we're an Air Force family. And so I think maybe this resonated with us just because we, we moved around quite a bit when we were growing up. And so I kind of, mm-hmm. kind of this idea of home and centralized location and whatnot. But he got the idea. Um, my great or my grandfather lived in a little town uh, called Astoria, Oregon, which is right on the Columbia River, and it's right at the the foot of the right at the mouth of the Columbia River. And um, there was a clock in the house, and it, it was this clock that was given to his mother, no, his great his grandmother, excuse me, as a wedding gift in the late 1800s. And so he he my brother saw this clock when he was a kid, and it had like a little note attached to it. And the note was written about the provenance and kind of told the whole story of where it came from. But that little, he kind of realized that if that note was ever lost, there goes the story and the, and the mm-hmm. significance of the clock. And so that's kind of where the idea came from. So, Well, and, and you don't want this to happen, you know. You don't want your heirlooms to go and get beat around and pictures taken out and sold mm-hmm. separately and and lost. And this is just one of the pages in this is in this um, Victorian photo album and luckily a nephew of the owner of it had typewritten some information there so you go we're, we're able to use that so that's essentially you know what it is exactly it's just exactly online what it is. right yeah, it's just and, online. and it's online so that you know if someone let's say you know God forbid something you got your, your heirloom got destroyed or something you still have a record of it forever um, Online and 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 now and you know and, and maybe or maybe just somebody one ha- person in the family has it, but then everybody has access to be able to see it and to see the story. That, and that's exactly it. That's kind of what makes it different. It's not just like putting it in Evernote or putting it in a Manila folder or something like that. I mean, that's great. That's the first step. But what's the point of having that information if there's not going to be easy access to it? I mean. You know, like I said, I've heard so many sad stories about um, kids going around, you know, after their parents have passed away. They walk around the house and they see all these objects and they have these objects that played this vital part of, you know, these, these people's lives and, and they have no idea what it all means. And so that's kind of what we're trying to do is make sure that those stories are saved, essentially. So exactly it. Yeah. I have a question. Um, if it has this asset tag, so to speak, on it, uh, if something like that book uh, that Caroline had had that tag in it, could someone who happens upon it at an estate sale or, you know, if they see that it's been given away or something, That's, are they also able to get the story and maybe get some, get something back to a family member exactly. or at least know what the story is? That's exactly it. In fact, yeah. um, here's like my, my brother-in-law his cookbook uh, that his grandfather had, um, he put a he registered it, and this is kind of what a, a a sticker looks like. It's really simple. It's just it's re- very simple. We we wanted to make it really easy too, um, just mm-hmm. for people to use. It's not it's not very complicated. You just go online, and you can upload photos, um, tell the story, all that stuff. But uh, exactly, I mean, if someone were to see uh, this cookbook, like say it ended up in an antique store. Someone were to see this in an antique store, they could see the sticker. They could go home. Anyone with access to the number and okay. you know on the sticker they could go get the story so definitely that's we kind of want to um, my brother jokes that we want to put antique roadshow out of business um, you know kind of like you know, telling all these provenances and so um, <laughs> really that's 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 exactly it I mean it's it, it we that's that's our passion is we want to make sure that those stories no matter what are going to be saved so. okay. and you right. can put the 48 hour ephemera challenge out of business too yeah, that's right. That's right. And there's, and there's also, and, and speaking of, and, and Denise Levinick, you mentioned her. I mean, she's been such a great support. You've been, and I should have thanked you right at the very beginning, but thank you so much for, you know, having me come on. You've been a great supporter too, but um, no, definitely. I mean, there's, there, Denise has uh, uh, been great. And then also, uh, I was going to mention uh, Just a Joy, because you mentioned the mm-hmm. Ephemera Challenge. I know, um, Joy, yeah. Yeah, Just a Joy, she, she kind of does what you guys were talking about, where she uh-huh. will connect um, like if say someone is is lost the family heirloom and she locates it, she'll make sure that they connect connect with the family. So that's kind of what she does. Yeah. There's lots of there's a few services out there like that. Yeah, I mean it, it's it, it's out there and and again they're all Google searchable and indexed yep. and so it's it makes it real easy to you know I don't uh, in the 48 hour ephemera challenge I don't concentrate on finding um, living individuals. Yeah. Um, because um, I don't know where they're at, and and <laughs> you know I don't know if they want it 
back because they want it back, you know, part of their family history if they're going to turn around and sell it. It's not a big deal when I'm doing a postcard that I paid a buck for, but, you know, I paid $53 plus tax for this thing, and yeah. it was regularly $97, and it even has a price tag at one time of $300. Wow. It's over 100 years old, and it has four tin types in it, and then it has a ton of 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 other photos in here and you know individually like the lady was saying oh you could take these out and sell these you can resell them for a really good problem like oh my god no I would never do that <laughs> <laughs> I can't stand uh, pawn, uh, pawn stars because <laughs> I mean I like the show yeah. but it breaks my heart that someone's yeah. going in there probably to get gambling money <laughs> I know. To, to sell you know his great-grandfather sword or something I'm like oh no and I start I yelling know. at the TV I'm like it's, it's not good for my blood pressure, that show. <laughs> it's, inter it's entertaining, but I'm like, are you kidding me? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, well, anyway, I want to thank you so much for joining us, Dan. Houston. Yeah, th thank you so much. Yeah, yeah well done. Uh, no, but th thank you very much. And I'm sorry, I'm, I'm probably a little sleep deprived, too. We just moved from actually Texas uh, to Oregon this week. So I just got settled into Oregon, but, um, so I was in Austin. We're going to miss you here in Texas. I know, I know I'm going to miss Texas too, but, uh, yeah, so, <laughs> but thank you though. I really appreciate it. So, yeah. and Tessa and Linda, thank you so much for joining us this evening. You're welcome. And next week we're going to have Denise Levinick on, and we may have some additional panelists as well, unless Tessa and Linda are not able to join us. But if they are able to join us, we're going to have some additional, I think, I hope, um, lined up. So I'm, I'm not going to jinx it by telling you who, so you're just going to have to tune in for that one. <laughs> um, also, if you want to be interviewed, if you have something that you want to promote, your business or, or whatever, something, a book you're launching, just contact me through my blog and uh, we'll get you lined up. No problem. And I think that's it. Circle me on Google+, follow me on Twitter, Facebook, wherever, and, um, and we will see you next week, next Friday, 8 p.m. Central time. And thanks so much for joining us this evening. Bye-bye. Good night. Good night. Good night.